Just a few days ago, King Salman of Saudi Arabia passed a series of royal decrees that are meant to smoothen the transition of power from the second to the third generation princes. Salman will be the last king of the second generation as he replaced his half-brother and crown prince Mugrin bin Abdulaziz with deputy crown prince Mohammed bin Najif. Furthermore, Salman's favorite son Mohammed bin Salman was appointed as the new deputy crown prince of Saudi Arabia. This and a dozen more cabinet and governmental changes were publicly announced in the early morning hours of 29th April 2015. At first glance, most of the decisions make sense. The country was bound to shift from second to third generation rulers. This was after all a very serious issue that was going on for years. But a closer look at the events reveals that underneath the reforms the king had ulterior motives including the strengthening of his own clan, the next generation of Sudairis. In a country where change is often slow and discreet, this reshuffling of the Saudi leadership is nothing less than groundbreaking. Some might even call it revolutionary, and some will call it a palace coup within the House of Saud. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. King Salman's earlier reforms dating back to January 2015 included the abolishment of 17 councils that had managed government affairs and in their place the king established two national committees. Thereby he streamlines the country's bureaucracy. However, King Salman's latest reshuffling of the cabinet drastically differs from anything before in the modern history of Saudi Arabia. The king appointed a new heir through a democratic council, empowered a few younger princes, he appointed the most pro-American minister in the Saudi government as the first in line for succession. The royal decrees also dismissed the health minister and two other deputies and then moved Khalid Al Fali, the CEO of the National Saudi Oil Company, Aramco, as the new head of the Ministry of Health. In addition, Amin Nassar is now the acting president of Saudi Aramco, the world's most valuable company whose total asset value is estimated to be somewhere between 2 and 7 trillion dollars. Another notable change is the replacement of Foreign Minister Saud Al Faisal with Adel Al Jubair, who is not part of the royal family. In short, King Salman's decisions are sensible and they prepare the country for the future generation of princes, but they also give talented people who are not part of the royal family new opportunities to contribute to their country. The decrees have been applauded by the country's religious establishment to ulama and they have been met with approval from the Americans and the Europeans. So this is what the leading mainstream media headlines are telling us. Here is what you have to understand about King Salman. He is a veteran in the Game of Thrones. For decades he was the one who settled royal conflicts and either promoted or demoted the Saudi princes of which there are an estimated 4,000. Managing these princes and their internal rivalries is what the king does best. Salman is like the Putin of Saudi Arabia. Every decision he makes is calculated, especially when it seems spontaneous. During the rule of the previous Saudi kings, there was an unwritten code that dates back to the death of the founder of the kingdom, Abdulaziz ibn Saud. When Ibn Saud passed away, he left behind 22 wives and 45 sons. Not everyone got along, because Ibn Saud had married from all across Arabia with the most prominent tribes. So the wives who raised their children had different mentalities and cultural backgrounds. It was a situation that was very similar to the Ottoman royal family and the imperial harems. Due to their differences, the Saudi wives and their sons formed their own clans within the royal family 
And much like the Ottomans, the Saudi royal family was divided into many clans that competed and rifled each other. When Ibn Saud died, a fierce struggle between his most senior sons erupted, Saud and Faisal. Nobody was really prepared for this internal conflict, but at the end, an unwritten agreement was reached. No single clan of the House of Saud would be allowed to dominate the government. Thus, the succession of the king would be based on seniority and leadership credentials. Over the years, this rule was further polished and the clans rotated their positions. For example, if the first in line for succession was someone from the Faisal family, the second in line would be someone from the Sudari clan. The Faisals would be compensated by gaining a foreign ministry position. When it was the Sudari clan's turn, they would appoint an heir from a different clan, the Abdullah faction. The Abdullah faction would honor the code and not appoint a direct descendant of their own, but instead a different half-brother from a different clan. All the kings respected this code and it unified the royal family because it didn't allow a single clan to dominate the government. That is, all kings until now. Prior to the death of King Abdullah in March 2014, the king had passed a royal decree that placed his half-brother Mukrin as the deputy crown prince. King Abdullah specifically mentioned in the decree that no other person, not even the next king, would be allowed to modify or change the position of the appointed deputy crown prince. When Abdullah passed away, King Salman of the Sudairi clan initially respected his half-brother's decree and elevated Mukrin from second to first in line to succession. But at the same time, King Salman also elevated his favorite son, the 30 or 35-year-old Prince Muhammad bin Salman, as the country's new defense minister and as the country's new second deputy prime minister, the secretary general of the royal court and as a member of the economic and development council. King Salman's nephew and minister of interior, Mohammed bin Najib, became the country's first deputy prime minister and he also bypassed hundreds of senior princes to become the first of the third generation princes to be officially placed in the line of succession as the new deputy crown prince. So King Salman's consolidation of power on behalf of his clan began right after the death of King Abdullah. The showering of titles and having such a young prince in such high positions is unheard of in Arab tribal culture and there is a lot of international commotion over the decision to have an unexperienced defense minister leading the Gulf Cooperation Council's war against the Shia-based Houthi rebellion in neighboring Yemen. Many of the member states of the Gulf Cooperation Council are uneasy with the young defense minister. Now it's true that Prince Mohammed bin Salman is neither experienced nor even educated in any of the positions he occupies. But that was never the intention. You see, the economic bureaucracy, foreign affairs, law and governance and the military positions are usually preserved for prominent princes who are expected to one day to sit on the throne or who are expected to lead the country. By occupying all the positions, there was nothing else left to give to the crown prince Mugrin. And thus, in practical terms, Mugrin had a title, but no power or position or whatsoever. So the purpose behind extending Najib and Muhammad with governmental positions was not because they were extraordinarily gifted or because Mugrin was incompetent, no, the purpose was to make it easier for King Salman to depose of Mugrin later on, and that is exactly what happened. In April 29th, 2015, King Salman broke King Abdullah's decree 
and replaced the powerless Crown Prince Mugrin with the deputy Crown Prince Najif and promoted his own son, Muhammad, as the new deputy Crown Prince. What is important to keep in mind here is that Najif has two daughters but no confirmed sons, so he is the ideal future king because he is unlikely to shake up the order of succession and that is exactly what King Salman needs. It's possible that over time Najif and Muhammad, especially the younger prince, will be relieved from several offices, but for now all titles combined, Muhammad and Najif now occupy the most powerful offices in the Saudi government and this allowed for the smooth dismissal of Mugrin. If Mugrin had been a defense minister or if he had any kind of relevant position, King Salman would not have been able to replace him as first in line, not unless he was willing to face armed resistance. A similar situation unfolded against the foreign minister Prince Saud Al Faisal. Since 1962, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was reserved for the members of the Faisal family. Under the pretext of health concerns and to improve relations with Washington, Al Faisal was replaced by the Saudi ambassador to the United States, Adel Al Jubeir, a non royal technocrat. With this move, King Salman has eliminated yet another powerful competing clan, the Faisal family. King Salman's power grab for his clan is technically a coup, because it not only breaks a royal decree, but it also breaks the unwritten code of power rotation. Without Mugrin and the Faisal family in charge, the Sudairi clan has taken a dominant position in the House of Saud. These series of changes have not gone by unnoticed. Some of the princes have outright condemned it as a palace coup by the Sudairi clan, and some princes have even condemned it as being un Islamic. King Salman argues that his decree was approved by 28 of the 34 members of the Allegiance Council. This council was established in 2007 by King Abdullah with the goal to formalize succession process by appointing a new king or a new crown prince. In reality, however, the council will just endorse whatever the current monarch puts forth. It's also important to note that King Salman's decisions comes at the height of the ongoing Cold War with Iran. The only reason why the entire Saudi structure doesn't fall apart is because of the immediate danger to the country posed by Iran. And that is exactly how King Salman wants to keep it. For kings, sultans, tsars and rulers, fair is a tool to unite a community with shared interests. It's the oldest story in the book and it keeps on working. The irrational fear of an expanding Iran by the Saudi propaganda narrative is what keeps the other clans united within the House of Saud, despite the expanding influence of the Sudairis. Under the pretext of fair stability and security, King Salman has been able to consolidate the Sudairis in dominant governmental positions. The king is eyeing for two more major changes in the near future. First, the separation of the Saudi Aramco from the Ministry of Oil and the replacement of technocrat Ali Al Naimi with another Sudairi member, possibly Abdulaziz bin Salman, who was just recently appointed from assistant to deputy oil minister. The second change is that of the Ministry of the National Guard and the son of the former king Mutaib bin Abdullah. Mutaib will be more difficult to replace as he is the commander of a 100,000 strong military force spread out throughout the country. His position is one that parallels and rivals that of the Ministry of Defense. For now, there is a lot of uncertainty for the Saudis, but none understand the Saudi Game of Thrones better than King Salman. 
He will continue to strengthen and empower the position of his clan and he will continue to exploit the ongoing regional cold war with Iran for domestic purposes. This was a Caspian report by me Shirvan. For more information, please visit the social media pages. And if you want to support Caspian Report, please visit the Patreon site in the description. For now, thank you for watching, take care and sarol.